there are decisions in life which are completely impossible to make entirely rationally simply because having children, for example, affects your preferences and your utility function to so great an extent that the role of a frontline worker, which used to be actually quite broad, has become very, very narrowly defined simply in terms of what you can quantify. And the jobs that used to be performed by frontline workers, which included training and recruitment, have been outsourced to people who are less qualified to do it. One of the miracles of capitalism is it enables cooperation that goes beyond those kind of allegiances. This week, we spoke with Rory Sutherland about his book, Alchemy, and the difference between the conventional logic that seems to dictate business thinking versus the psychologic or magic that could more prevalently dominate business thinking. Such an interesting thinker and writer, and we're very pleased to have him in the Sage Exchange this week. Wow, look at that. I just we we just blew blew backwards and now we've got a um a larger a larger vista. There we this are. This is a fantastic device, absolutely fabulous device made by Facebook stroke Meta called the Portal, which they've now discontinued. Yeah. Which is absolutely foolish because um it's one of those technologies that is going to take ten years to take off. But yes. um uh, I thought it was an absolutely daft decision because video conferencing on the television is the most underexploited technological um, uh, um, marriage that uh, is, uh, it's completely bizarre that it isn't more common. Yeah, well, um, we, we end up needing to take up some instruction for many of our clients on ways to hack the eye contact gap that naturally exists yes. and 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 there's so many other things like just the sense of depth and dimension is gone in so many of these conversations and even the slightest um help by the tech would <laughs> would get us part of the way no I, 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 but by, the, by the way i mean it's utterly bizarre in that there's this huge debate about the productivity of remote versus, um, uh, you know, physical co-location uh, in the workplace. But there should be a completely separate area of debate, which is how you optimize productivity in both spaces. OK. Yes. Yes. And actually, yes. actually, one of the stupidest things, I, I'm take, take an example, OK. Uh, the open plan office is, a, in my view, is a disaster because it's, it's an attempt to solve for the average, which solves for nothing. And the point is that there are two roles for an office, one of which is library and the other one of which is pub. You know, if you take the two extremes, you either go to the office for solitude uh, or you go to the office for sociability. And in the open plan office, we then created an area which isn't solitude. It isn't sociable either because you disturb people if you have a conversation. Uh, it is totally unsuited to two things which can be huge productivity boosts, one of which is video conferencing, because you don't have any privacy, and the other one of which, which is the one of the best attested productivity gains you can have, which is multiple screens. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you actually want to improve your productivity, partly because of a thing called switching costs, where if you basically switch from one piece of software to another, uh, there's both a mental cost in that and a in other words, there's actually a technological cost, which is it wastes time every time you move. But actually, there's also a mental cost in that there's a thing called a switching cost, which is that by effectively having to ch keep switching the focus of your attention, um, uh, it basically uh, destroys what you might call uninterrupted time. And so, you know, the multiple monitor is one of the biggest things you can do to improve productivity. And yet very, very few... Um, you know, uh, the, the the open plan office was was totally ill suited to it. Well, you you've also uh, seen. I don't know what it's like in your offices with with Ogilvy or your clients, but you've seen uh, a mushrooming of these individual call booths, and they get smaller and smaller. So now they're the size of like the old UK call booth inside the offices, so people can have a damn bit of privacy, and. For for years we worked in in um, co working spaces. The the highest value real estate in a co working space is that tiny little postage stamp 
of a yes. of a call booth. Is that everybody? Is that interesting? Yeah. Stuff. And actually, there are various sort of businesses which have started up started up offering pods in public spaces. And yeah. it's one of those things which, again, is one of those things which I suspect it's kind of, uh, you know, it will take a long time for that business to take off. Um, and um, the, uh, you know, the, the, um, pods in public space are interesting because, I mean, airport lounges are a classic case where undoubtedly the highest value real estate in an airport lounge would be, if they had them, the little private pod. Yeah. Um, and that's very interesting. Your, your lesson from your co-working space is that that's, that's the space that everybody really wants. Fascinating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. People pretend like they're doing work at a little six, six-seater six table nearby just just so they can nab the, the uh, booth the second it's free. <laughs> And then there's also a kind of emotional um, need for it, I think. We, I mean, it's very interesting. When, when Costa designed their Costa coffees in China, they found that there was a kind of... Whereas British people were happy sitting in sort of open view in a cafe, what Chinese people wanted from a Costa was a nook. And actually, right. the, the, the nook is actually the most undervalued piece of real estate. Because if you measure real estate purely in square meters or square feet, a nook doesn't have much value. But actually, yeah. you know, they're extraordinarily useful. There's something, um, you know... This house you, I ever visited. My, my brother-in-law lived in a mid-century house in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles for a time. He's a script writer. And it had the most brilliant idea, which was two adjacent square rooms, which overlapped by 50%, with a movable divider. And so it was the most brilliant thing. You could host a party for 100 people by pushing the divider back, which made it into a big room. But you pulled the divider back and you had two family, you, know, you had a dining room and a reception room or whatever you wanted. It was complete genius. Yeah. You know, Rory, one of the things that we have been evolving is the manuscript for a publication um, tackling a philosophical question. That's that's my personal background, and it's relevant to the work we do for our clients. But the topic so, is... So what your is, background is as a philosopher? Yes. That's fascinating. My daughter's just doing a master's in philosophy. She's just got a first in philosophy from Manchester, and she's doing a, a, a master's degree. But I'm always, for obvious selfish reasons, I'm always intrigued to know what the commercial applications of philosoph philosophy degrees are. And so um, I, I've got no doubt, by the way, personally, that it's an incredibly valuable field of study. Um, of course. But, well, uh, you're, you're a classicist, right? I mean, you, you did classics. Yeah. 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 And I would say when when we read your your book and when I when I listened to your other lectures, it's coming through constantly um, in, in a variety of forms. I don't know sort of who who your favorite of the classics are, but um, the questions that you're asking are are sort of like what Xenophon says so Socrates was up to uh, questions like well wait a minute what is a state guys what's a yes. statesman um, and also so they're the classical because so I, I did do quite a bit of classical mostly Epicureanism actually but the other okay. the other area of, so, someone told me that they said what you don't realize is that you're basically a phenomenologist oh um, yeah in philosophical sure. terms yeah yeah, well, yeah, you um uh there's a there's sort of a a, a pair of thinkers, a husband and wife, the the uh Thomases who who came up with this sort of psychological uh insight that what we per perceive as real is real in its consequences. Of and course. um that was that was ringing in my head all the way through your your chapters. I mean, you you as yeah, much so, as so the idea in 20 ways the idea that there's an objective definition of value for money that's independent of perception, which is to some extent what economy, I mean, not, yeah, I mean, mainstream economics almost attempts to remove any contextual or perceptual consideration by assuming perfect information, perfect trust, and perfect yeah. foreknowledge of the future. There's a very good book by a guy called um, uh, Russ Roberts, who hosts the Econ Talk podcast. And he makes the point that there are decisions in life 
which are completely impossible to make entirely rationally, simply because having children, for example, affects your preferences and your utility function to so great an extent. I mean, no one would have children rationally in the sense that if you ask a childless couple what they most enjoy in life, it's kind of staying out late, going on exotic holidays, having a lot of disposable income, all of which are completely destroyed by having children. But the simple yes. truth is that when you have children, what seems worthwhile to you fundamentally changes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's right. I think I think there might be one other place where that comes that that, that clear with which is the uh the religious conversion i know there's not like you know uh, waves and droves of that but you do you do see that right uh and well you certainly see it throughout the classics as well um and it, it, it's interesting i think because one of the things it provides you with is a narrative to explain change to yourself yeah, right so I mean, one of the interesting things is that, that, that uh, this is, I, I, I hope this isn't, a, you know, so when Richard Doll, now Sir Richard Doll, did his groundbreaking research into the link between tobacco and lung cancer, okay, he actually made two discoveries. And one of them was publicized to everybody, and the other one was kept very quiet. The two discoveries were, one, there's a massive link between smoking and lung cancer. Everybody knows that. The other discovery he made is that people who quit smoking before the age of 35 appeared to have the same life expectancy as any as a non-smoker. Now, for very obvious reasons, they kept quiet about that, okay? Because, A, every 18-year-old goes, look, shut up, Dad, I've got another 17 years left, okay? Um, nobody's going to bother to quit smoking before the age of 35 once they know that fact. And lots of people are going to take up smoking, going, well, what the hell, I can worry about this in 17 years' time. There are very good reasons for suppressing the information. The only problem I have is that I think we've probably reached a stage where we need to make it public. Mm. And the reason is that it provides people with a narrative for why they quit. In other words, rather than going, so there are a lot of people, I think, a lot of people probably don't quit smoking because they think the damage has already been done. Um, and I think that's a very dangerous narrative because they go, well, it's too late now. Either there was a cigarette with my name on it or there yeah. wasn't, you know. Yeah. Um, but actually, one of the interesting things about 35 is now you've got a point at which you can say, okay, I do, you know, Instead of thinking, well, there's no point in me quitting, the damage has already been done, you've got a very good story. Well, I used to smoke, but I realized that after 35, it's something you can't afford to do. It's rather like having children. You know, people actually say they quit smoking because they had children. And it's a much better narrative than saying, I used to be an idiot and now I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Do you see what I mean? Of course I do. Of course I do. Um, we actually need. We actually need a lot of... We need an awful lot of storytelling to change our mind about things. You know, it's a painful process just changing your mind, and it needs a toolkit. And uh, to see us through the dissonance. Yeah, yeah. So tell me what your business does. I'm absolutely intrigued. Well, we're taking on uh, we're taking on a dragon that might be bigger than the tiny little uh, set of armor and and uh, weapons we have, but we're. We're, we deal with how organizations teach and learn. Oh. I don't, I don't love, and um, and what I mean is I kind of hate the the standing architecture that most organizations have called learning and development. Oh, it's staffed by all the wrong people. Um, it doesn't uh, understand or take into account um, the the range of of kind of talent and experience that usually exists inside no. an organization, and uh, it it under what would you say it, it reduces the burden and the, and the expectation on on senior folks to be teachers and i don't think well, that's this, this is a really really interesting point because that it suddenly occurred to me that what has happened in businesses is that a large bureaucracy has emerged which sets which survives as a bureaucracy and grows because it sets itself up as arbiters of the people who actually do the real work Hmm. OK, and the finance function and all these other functions are seen to be there to maximize the productivity as very narrowly defined of a frontline worker. OK, yes. 
And what we don't notice is that that has meant that the role of a frontline worker, which used to be actually quite broad, has become very, very narrowly defined simply in terms of what you can quantify. And the jobs that used to be performed by frontline workers, which included training and recruitment, have been outsourced to people who are less qualified to do it. And so I often say, I ask the question of anybody working in Ogilvy, what's the most important thing you can do in, your, in a working day? Okay. And they, you know, they might say winning a new bit of business and so on. They go, well, that might be the most important thing you can do. I would argue that the most important thing you can ever do is find and hire someone who's really good, who's a game changer. Because, you know, in the time I was a creative director, the most important decision I made was undoubtedly, you know, uh, about four people I hired. You know, besides that, a lot of the, not, not everything else, I'm not saying I was totally irrelevant in doing the job, but a lot of the type of things I spent my time doing pale by comparison. Mm -hmm. And yet we've actually, in the, in the urge to drive visible productivity in the workforce, we've effectively crowded out a lot of the functions. It's also made those frontline jobs much less rewarding because you have much less opportunity to exercise discretionary judgment. Mm. And so your job has been algorithmized. And I think that, you know, a part of the reward for being a senior doctor used to be, okay, that you were a bit of a mensch and you had a group of people who you looked after. Now, it's highly likely now that you cannot hire into that group, nor can you fire from that group, hmm. because that decision takes place somewhere else. So your ability to exercise what you might call a form of um, patronage as a senior person has been destroyed. Now, I said this of Ogilvy, and I, I think Ogilvy is a lot less to blame in this than most organizations, but I said, when I was hired as a graduate trainee, I was hired by the chairman of the company who was an immensely eminent um, um, uh, uh, direct marketer, Drayton Bird. I was hired by people who went on to become creative directors, who went on to become uh, you know, very eminent in the field. Okay, And I said jokingly, when I get fired from Ogilvy 35 years later, it'll be a decision taken by HR and finance. Not by people who practice what I actually do, hmm. but by effectively a kind of bureaucratic there's a thing called Pornell's Iron Law of Bureaucracy, which says in any organization, those people dedicated to the bureaucracy will outgrow and outrank those people who are dedicated to the things the bureaucracy is supposed to achieve. And I see that happening absolutely everywhere. And it strikes me as something which is actually anthropologically quite damaging. Because, you know, if I can't, if I can't, if I have a group of people working for me whom I can't get fired, I can't give them a pay rise, I can't, I can't choose them, okay? Yes. Something about the nature of that group has been fundamentally changed. Yeah, how interesting, right? Uh, the, two, the two areas that you picked off, hiring and, yeah. um, <clears throat> and developing. Um, and remuneration and promotion and so on, yeah. They're... They are, uh, well, they're alchemical, um, Rory, to steal a little bit of your your um, your manuscript. Throughout the book, I was thinking, wait a minute, like th these are, a, a lot of this is addressed to marketing and uh, individual buyer decisions. But actually, there's so many features of the workplace, particularly in this kind of leadership, mentorship and development yeah. quadrant that are alchemical. Um uh, where, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the instincts of experienced people trying to relay, you know, the, the things that they learned under a kind of mentorship or apprenticeship model and, and relay them on actually are much more powerful than, um, than the things you can learn in, uh, in, in a six week leadership course in terms of how you're supposed to manage someone. Almost tribal, very almost tribal almost ritualistic and rights-based um, way of taking somebody through their career. And there's also, you know, there's also a question of the, de the devolution of autonomy, where there's a very interesting guy who's the chief 
operating officer of Shopify in Canada. And he was responsible for the, effectively, the customer support teams. But, and by customer, I don't mean retail customer. I mean the retailers, the online retailers who use Shopify. Okay. And they were, by some measure, the least well-paid people in the organization because they were frontline staff. They were also the happiest people in the organization. And he obtained this by basically dividing them into groups of 10 because he said that all sports teams... <laughs> you know, as somewhere between nine and fifteen, that you can, if you create autonomous sort of self-governing groups of ten, you can achieve a level of kind of reciprocation and obligation which simply doesn't exist in a wider organisation. And so, this business of economies of scale is really a bureaucratizing myth. Okay that makes possible a degree of centralization, which in reality is fundamentally unhealthy. I mean, you know, there are economies of scale. I think there are things that should be done centrally. You know, if you're a police force, your forensics should be localized, okay? Yes. <laughs> but the actual business of street policing really, really should be, you know, for all kinds of reasons. You're gonna be, a, you're gonna be obligated to a group of 100 people in a way you're not obligated to a company of 1,000. Uh, you're going to, you know, people will notice who's slinging their hook, you know, who's pulling their weight and who's slinging their hook. And therefore, working to impress your peer group is in many ways actually a better incentive than working to improve, improve, impress your manager, which often leads to people just gaming the system. Or, as I think Jack Welch once said, to an organisation which has its face oriented towards the management and its arse directed towards the customer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, and and so there are all these there are all these cases where you have diseconomies of scale where actually uh, you know a degree of localism is required, and actually the centralisation of the I mean bluntly put, if I apply for a pay rise, the decision is taken by someone who doesn't know who I am. Okay. Yes. It'll be someone in a finance function with an organisation who does not know anything about me. Now. That's simply an appalling state of affairs. So the way in which incentives are directed. The other thing is, uh, there's a book I recommend to you called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott, who is an anarchist anthropologist. And he argues that organizations and programs are designed to maximize the legibility and comprehension of people at the top. And so what, what arises from that is, is the standard organogram of the, the organizational pyramid, okay? The problem with that pyramid is there are no lines drawn horizontally. They're reporting lines about responsibility. But value in an organization is overwhelmingly created horizontally. And, you know, there, there's a really, you know, there's a really, every time you see one of those I, I never really understood it because I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. My father was a self-employed businessman, okay? And I don't really understand, even now, corporate life. I don't, it, it doesn't make any sense, okay? And I never understood this obsession with reporting lines because when I was a copywriter, we divided the account people with whom we worked into two, not senior ones and junior ones. It was good ones and shit ones, <laughs> okay? And if you find yourself, it didn't matter the seniority. If you found yourself working with a good one, you did good work and it was great. And if you found yourself working with someone who's shit, you never got anywhere. And so what people did as a copywriter in an advertising agency is the first thing you learned to do was adopt and form allegiances with a highly promising, not necessarily senior person in your, uh, uh, in your, what you might call your opposite numbers, among your opposite numbers. And that, you know, that's how the world works. It works horizontally for the most part. And actually most innovation happens through mm. horizontal collisions. And mm. yet the organization, and I think, I have to say, I think two things have enabled this. Technology, which brings with it the illusion of the possibility of centralization to deliver economies of scale, and the second thing is probably the shareholder value movement. You know, the belief that the single purpose of an organization is to maximize shareholder value, which over concentrates uh, power uh, in too narrow a field of people, typically a bureaucratic field like finance, 
not a customer facing part of the organization yeah i don't know i don't know if you um i don't know if you resonate with this but the the school that is sort of sought to overcome the shareholder centric uh viewpoint i guess that's maybe friedman is um you use this word stakeholder and i don't love yes. that I, I don't oh. love that because because I don't think it actually gets to the heart of something you're you're talking about. Um, and I, I just wonder with this, the, the concept of a horizontal connection. Mm. It's really central to like, what is a workplace? We, we, we were I guess we have a, a house view that there's such a thing as colleagueship and such a thing as friendship and colleagueship is just not that well understood. And so it's been some it's been replaced with something like we ought to be friends at work and you'll see organizations from a central place trying to basically ensure that their employees are friends with one another and i don't th uh, my sense is it's not appropriate it doesn't actually fit you don't want your colleagues to be your friends you want your colleagues to be your colleagues and that's its own honorable craft you know um Aristotle would call it sort of like a, a role in society. There's such a thing that is a colleague. There's such a thing that is a friend. And y y you could evince friendship in in the way that you are a colleague, but it's its own discipline. And everybody knows it. They, they, they blur, but they can be, of course, entirely separate things. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the most extreme cases being partnerships of people who, on a personal level, don't like each other very much, but who... Yeah, in a sense, one, you know, one, of, one of the miracles of capitalism is it enables cooperation that goes beyond those kind of allegiances. Uh, you know, that actually, it, it, you know, it allows people to do business with people whom, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in a highly profitable and valuable way, which would, you know, I mean, you know, the ties of kinship were the obvious ones. OK, I mean, there, I think there are poor countries which are still poor because they fundamentally can't escape from um, uh, family loyalties. Yeah. There was a Canadian guy who tried to build a school in Haiti. And what he couldn't understand is why building a school in Haiti was more expensive than building a school in Canada, until he realized that if you give anybody in, in, in that culture $20,000, their first thought is, how do I prevent this leaving my family? And so they will invent, you know, they will find a family builder who isn't very good in order to effectively retain the money within that particular group. Wow. And so being able to break out of those ties is really important. But at the same time, there's an opposite problem where actually uh, the entire practice of business has become so transactional and anonymized that you have actually, there's nothing else there. And so there is this really vital question of, you know, of where things work centrally and where things work locally. And if you want to solve a problem, the first thing you have to do is solve the problem at a scale appropriate to its solution. And if problems are referred upwards to the top, quite often, this is, again, James C. Scott, you know, that there are problems that you can't solve at the top that you can solve at the bottom and vice versa. Um, and it's very interesting in terms of decision making. I mean, I would argue that the whole question of migration and immigration has partly been proved uh, uh, insoluble because people have wanted to legislate for it and you kind of can't, okay? Right. It's too yeah. context dependent. The decision of whether you admit someone to a country or not is highly contextually dependent and you can't really write down rules. Now, my suggestion to that is we in the Anglo-Saxon world have a thousand year old solution for solving problems like that, and it's called the jury system. And that there may be a case for saying there are certain decisions which should just be dissolved, you know, devolved to an independent jury of 12 citizens and a judge, you know, and a couple of expert witnesses, and you make the decision. Now, okay, it's not perfect from the, the point of view of being capable of generalization. We, you know, we sentence, you know, we, I mean, countries sentence people to life imprisonment on the basis of that decision making unit. It shouldn't be therefore right. considered to be ridiculous to decide whether someone lives in France or lives in, in, in London on the basis of that, that unit. And, it, you know, and it's in, in very interesting that we have a jury. It's very interesting that the jury system survives. It is interestingly, I suppose you could say of the jury system, 
it is inherently biased towards acquittal in that the judge is still free to throw out a case. Okay, if the judge thinks the case has not been made satisfactorily, the judge can throw out the case. Very famous case in Britain of a guy called Colin Stagg, who is wrongly prosecuted for a murder which he definitely did not commit. Um, and it was very unfashionable because the tabloids had whipped up a frenzy against this guy. And the judge, because it involved police kind of, it involved a degree of police agent provocateurism, you know, where they effectively attempted to honey trap the guy. And the judge threw it out. Judge Justice Ognall, I think his name was, or Ogden, um, Ognall, I think. But it, it was a very, very brave piece of decision making. At the same time, you get cases where juries throw out cases where the case has been legally made because they simply think it's unreasonable to penalise someone for this behaviour. You know, that happens, I think, rather a lot, to be honest. I had a friend who was on a jury where it was a case of kind of assault, but the person he'd assaulted had poured paint stripper over his car and attacked his front door with an axe. And the jury just sat there knowing this guy was guilty of punching the person in the face and said, if someone did that to me, I'd do exactly the same. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, so, you know, so, so they're, they're very, it's very, very interesting, which is this whole question of scale appropriateness. And one of the things we probably need in the UK, I mean, you have an advantage in the US in a way, although it doesn't help with questions like, obviously, uh, Roe v. Wade. But, you know, the states are to some extent uh, autonomous. And as a consequence, there are some solutions you can you can achieve at the state level, which would never be achieved, you know, at the federal level and so on. And so the, that sort of fractal nesting of decision making is really important. Yes. And I think technology destroys it. I think in many yes. cases, technology by creating this myth of economies of scale, which is peddled by consultants and, you know, tech vendors and everybody else, and by selling the dream of centralized legibility, nobody at the top of an organization has a clue what's going on, okay? I mean, genuinely, I'm not a flaming clue, huh? Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, if you can sell them the fantasy of kind of greater comprehension of their organization, they're always going to buy it. But the hidden price you pay is that that fractal devolved decision making and subsidiarity uh, gets destroyed and things start decisions start now an extreme tech case okay i'll give you a lovely example of this because it's anecdotal but telling i belong to amazon prime have done since the very beginning for some reason and i still couldn't i still can't get to the bottom of it it started refusing to deliver except on three days of the week okay so if I, if I went on on Sunday, it would only offer to deliver on Tuesday or Wednesday. There was no next day delivery unless I was the day before Tuesday, the day before Friday. Now, this wasn't Amazon Prime Day, which I know is a thing. I would opted out of that. And I, I, I phoned up Amazon. I suddenly realized the only person who knows what this problem is and knows how to solve it is in Seattle, has stock options worth $5 million and doesn't care a shit about me. OK, now I eventually solved the problem because I I continually experimented with reformatting my address until the problem went away. I still have no idea what caused this problem, whether I was part of a test cell which went rogue. I, I had no idea. But then nor did anybody else. And I suddenly realized that you, you're in this awful position where. Effectively, your fate is in the hands of someone who doesn't know about you, doesn't care about you, and is basically just trying to write universal rules independent of the specific situation. And, 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 you know, I learned this being in prison in Qatar for 24 hours, which is that a, re a really bad bureaucracy is in many ways worse than a tyranny. Because <laughs> yeah. what you actually created is actually a tyranny without the power to forget it. Yes, yes, yes. With, with without at, at least the caprice of yes. uh, a mustachioed beret wearing mm. uh, guy with a bunch of uh, fake uh, you military. Might, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, at, at least, least there's some reason you would have this. Yeah. <laughs> as you were as you were saying that, I was thinking you. There's two real champions from the UK who have who have been onto this in the past. 
Um, Edmund Burke talked about the, the significance of the little platoons of yes. society. And um, that has always stuck with me. And I, I think it's very relevant in the workplace too, which is why it's it's great. Like if if an organization, in my view, can see that there's like an you know an antique toy collectors group yeah. clique forming, let that thing form. And uh, when you were talking about your friend in Canada, that's where I'm calling from, by the way, Southern Alberta today. Um, oh, your brilliant. friend in Fantastic. Canada with, with, with groups of ten. Actually, I'll give you I'll give you three great Brits. Another great Brit from past was Lord Baden Powell, who only organized the Boy Scouts in groups of six and took his organization to two million <coughs> decentralized yes. globally at a time where there was barely telephones. Two million. It, it, this is in the early uh, 1910s. The, the third one is a kind of a personal hero, um, Roger Scruton. I don't know if you ever got to know him. Yes, I, 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 I think I met him once. No, actually... I think I was behind him in a queue to buy shoes in Cambridge in 1980-something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a good fellow. And he, he talks at great length. I'm going back now to your comments on, on a jury system as, an alt, as a creative solution to uh, immigration. He talks about the importance of the plural pronoun, we. You have to... You have to be able to say we in coherent sentences and mean something by it. And it and and to be the one who can speak a we based sentence like we believe this, we like that, we prefer this, we have a vision yes. for how things go, that means something. And um and then you're welcoming people into something. If you can if you can articulate a we sentence, uh the voice that can do that means that you're bringing somebody into something that's set, a real fabric. Very, very interesting. The, 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 the use of, and of course, we is interestingly fractal, isn't it? Because it can mean my family, it can mean my company, it can mean my county, my province, and so on. Um, and it has different sort of meanings in a sense. Um, yes. Uh, the... Um, there's a very, it's a very, very interesting, this is a very interesting question. And the Burke also has a brilliant quote about cattle underneath the trees and the chirp of the crickets, which makes the point that what's really, you know, what's really going on in society isn't best represented by what generates the noise, which I think is also an important factor. Yes. And it, it, it is, it, it is fundamentally interesting because devolving decisions down to uh, the scale at which people can use a mixture of incommensurable forms of information to arrive at a decision, for example. If you try and legislate for a decision or you try to make an algorithm out of a decision, generally you'll suffer from quantification bias. I mean, and what's interesting about a jury, by the way, and you have to say this is probably probably a good thing, is there is material that's evidential and there's material that isn't. Okay, now, if you make it purely a legalistic matter, anything that isn't evidential is ignored. Whereas a jury can take account of, effectively, that, you know... Um, uh, now, okay, sometimes that manifests itself in the fact that the guy who looks shifty is less likely to get off than the attractive person, and things like that. We've got to be conscious of those biases. But at the same time, it can also use information which might have, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, no pure evidential value, but it's nonetheless what you might call a contributory factor in making the decision. I'll give you an example. Cops use that information all the time. OK, so cops will make use of an awful lot of information that's not evidential. Uh, so an example would be uh, we've just had a nurse possible case of a serial killer female nurse in the UK, although there is an intelligent statistical movement that slightly questions the evidence, but I'll part that one. But there was an earlier nurse called Beverly Allett who was arrested who was definitely guilty of, of kind of uh, murdering, um, was it the elderly or was it children? I can't remember, under her care. Um, and one of the things the cops noticed is that if you arrest someone for something they haven't done, they're usually really, really angry, even if they're a criminal. Okay, they get really angry. 
about being arrested for something they haven't done. And, you know, in both cases, the person when arrested just sort of demurely got into the car. Okay. Now, that's, you know, that's, that has no evidential value, but it's not right. irrelevant. You know, it's not completely irrelevant at the same time. And so, you know, police investigations often start with things which are literally anecdotal because yes, the anecdote yes. doesn't actually convict the criminal, but it tells you where to look next. And that's one of the reasons I often get very cross about people, you know, the whole p-value thing in science. And when people dismiss something as anecdotal, I say, look, humans have evolved to pay attention to anecdotes for a reason. And the reason we pay attention to anecdotes is it's where significant information manifests itself first. You know, I mean, the most classic case being gossip. I went into this shop and they claimed that I hadn't paid for something. OK, well, that in itself doesn't mean the shopkeeper should be arrested, but it does mean you should be doubly cautious when shopping there in the future or you should simply yeah. be more alert. And so those you know, those kind of things, I think, are really interesting because, I mean, we've, we've come into this this scientific method where you where, you know, the degree of certainty of a piece of information also determines its significance. It's a very stupid way to proceed. Because there's information that's highly uncertain but potentially very important. And there's information that's highly certain but totally irrelevant. Okay. Yeah, I think this is really this has some amazing applications, Roy, to, to the workplace as well, in the form of veterans, you know, silverbacks and uh <clears throat> yeah. the the folks who have been around a long time be like, I don't like this deal. Like, okay, no. why? And, and if you go back and you say, why? Because I need to hear in our preset criteria for deal evaluation, be like, no, 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 it doesn't fit in there. Um, I don't like it because I don't like somebody who would be interested in closing a deal, you know, with, without a, a single cocktail, having exchanged parties anywhere along the way. Something's not right here. You're like, well, wait a minute, sorry. You know, uncle, we haven't got time for your uh, superstitions. Um, you know, we need to move on. But actually, those things, those um, r almost ritualistic instincts yeah. can embed um, wisdom, which if you wanted to quantify, you could maybe. But actually, they embed something that sort of... Well, elder... Also, of course, one of the interesting things with data is that uh, processing data is one thing. It's quite easy. We do it, you know, all the time. But then there's that Sherlock Holmes story, the single, the silver blaze, which involves the dog that didn't bark in the night. Yes. And quite a lot of that silverback experience is, that's weird, why didn't that happen? I remember very early in the days of home computing, I was in a research group um, funded by Compaq. And they were talking to these various households who are planning to spend now, bear in mind, this was the 1990s, so a thousand pounds was the cost of a computer, which is more like two and a half now. You know, it's a significant, really, really significant purchase. And, you know, you had endless decisions about the monitor, the CPU, the so and so, Intel, etc. And I said at the very end, I said, there's one weird thing nobody has mentioned the cost of software. Okay. And, you know, and we suddenly, I said, look, I think there's a very simple reason here. They're basically, you know, all the Microsoft Word, Windows stuff, okay. They're, well, actually, they, Windows would be pre-installed, okay. But the Microsoft Word, you know, they're basically planning to nick it from work, aren't they? <laughs> okay. Or they're going to nick it from a friend, okay. They're not planning to pay for this at all. And yeah. it's, just, it, it's just that thing, which is the conversation that never happened was the strange thing. And it's, much, yeah. they, you know... Data analytics isn't very good at noticing the mysterious absence of things. Yeah, that's great. That's great. There's, there's also this is this is the root of a bunch of the sort of Poirot episodes where you know the yeah. the, 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 the genius of Poirot is not is not the thing that um, the Trump viewers can also see. It's it's the it's sort of the in what do you call it? like the intercostal space? It's like the, the gap in mm. between things. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah. And it's it's and of course it's important information, but it's not necessarily information that's either salient or robust even.
Yeah, so one of the you things... Know, the G.K. Chesterton's, another example, with the Father Brown story is a similar in that, in that. But So how many people do you employ? I'm intrigued. Three. Three. Fascinating. Yeah. I wonder if we can actually work together, because in the great Zoom age, we've had some very successful Anglo-Canadian collaborations at Ogilvy. Um, it's actually a lot easier working with Canada than working with uh, New York. Um yeah, uh, just <laughs> general high levels of sanity um, and um, <laughs> elevated levels of sanity. And, um, but um, I'd, be, I'd be very interested in, in discussing that because this is a field where as a behavioral science practice and as Ogilvy Consulting, you know, my great problem with the ad industry is it's, it's entirely optimized around eating brand communication budgets. And yet the yes. potential market right. for human insight and creativity goes much, much wider than that. And I think we've failed, in a sense, with a few exceptions, like Ogilvy Consulting, which employs a few hundred people, okay? But with the exception of the consulting arm of Ogilvy, we've entirely failed at penetrating other budgets. Yeah. So at one level, one of the things that exercises me, as well as things like, you know, remuneration, incentivization, you know, uh, training, learning, development, recruitment, okay? which are obviously big behavioral questions. Um, the, other, the other area which interests me is um, uh, category problems. Because you can't, you know, the brand is not the appropriate level at which to solve every problem that's a marketing problem, okay? And the example I give here, um, uh, not very good to, uh, to a Canadian, the example I always give is range anxiety in electric cars, okay? Now, that is actually a pretty relevant fear in the American market, and it's probably not irrelevant in the Canadian market, although you all live in a straight line, don't you? So it makes things a bit easier. But I mean, Canada's <laughs> a kind of outlier because you have a lot of very big cities which are all bloody miles apart. Right. I mean, you, you know, and with a very slow train connection between yes. them. Yes, that's and right. You have extremes of heat, you have extremes of cold. I was going to okay. add that, but you've got it. Yeah, you have wilderness. Okay, now you know running. You know, only having twenty miles of range in a wilderness when there's ten miles to go to the only charger in a forty-mile radius is terrifying. Okay, right. you only have one hundred and ten volts of power because for some reason you went with your weedy neighbours to the south and didn't yeah. have a proper punchy. <laughs> okay, right. Now you know if I plug in in my dad's garage, it's two hundred and forty volts. 230 probably okay now it's not brilliant but if I'm, I'm i'm going to be spending four hours with my dad minimum okay that's four hours is going to be da, 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 da. it's going to be about 35 miles well that gets me to six rapid charges 35 miles even assuming i'm on naught which i'm not then there's another change in men which is simply a mentality change which is most people buy petrol gasoline as a distress purchase in other words, they wait till the yellow light comes on. And then if they're poorer, they just put in $20 worth. And if they're richer, they fill the tank. Mm -hmm. All it requires when you have an electric car is that charging becomes an opportunistic decision, an opportunistic purchase, not a distress purchase. And then all your problems are gone. You go, I've got to go to this shop. They have a charger. I'll charge while I'm in the shop. And as soon as you adopt that mentality, at least in a country like the UK, Basically, 90% 90 of the problem goes away. It's just not relevant. You know, and then again, there are things like, you know, now obviously in the US, now what, why this is important is that the UK is probably having bigger batteries in heavier cars that are more expensive than they need to be. And of course, fewer electric cars because of the insistence on a, no, I've got two electric cars. I don't have, I, the original plan was buy an electric car and then buy a petrol car for my wife. In the end, we like the electric car so much we bought an electric car for my wife. It only has 100 miles of range. You probably in a household, realistically, if you have one car that does about 90 miles of range and you have another car that does 170, 160, you're OK. In the UK, yeah. US, completely different matter. I, get, I grant that. Yes. But, but, but that's the kind of case where you have a behavioral and psychological problem which exists not at the brand level, but at the category level. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, by the way, if you have the Mini Cooper, elect which my wife does, 
the electric Mini Cooper, because the battery is quite small and doesn't weigh very much, that thing goes like shit off a shovel. I mean, the performance is insane. So there's another benefit, <laughs> which is you're really benefiting from the performance gain of electric cars by having smaller batteries. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, actually, in Canada, you probably have less of a problem than the US, as I said, because the what is it, ninety percent of your population live within a hundred miles of the US border. That's right. So you're effectively a bit like Chile. So actually, supplying a, a, a you know effectively, you know, and a yellow knife is going to be a bit of an issue, you know, but effectively, you know, a medicine hat, a place I've always wanted to go to, knowing absolutely nothing about it other than the name. Um, but you know, but for the most part, you'll probably won't have that much of a problem in Canada, except for the cold. Um, Medicine Hat is uh, it's just up the street from me. I mean, just to illustrate this, Medicine Hat is two hours drive, which by okay. uh, Alberta so, yeah. Prairie standards is nothing. It's nothing, right? It's you know you can you can pop. What's over it like? There. Um, it's pretty cool actually. Medicine Hat's got a good a good little vibe. It's a prairie town, um, yeah. and there, there's something that it means to be a beachside town, a mountain town, and a prairie town. Um, yeah. You know, having tra traveled around and, you know, I, I live in Asia, uh, but I'm here at the moment. Um, like a prairie town has its own feeling because because there's no yes. constraining um, geography to kind of bind you in. Um, so it's got that. It's very, it was very interesting that when you had the property crash in the U.S., the property crash hit worst. Now, they're not all technically prairie towns, but they are effectively Phoenix, Las Vegas, which have two qualities. They don't abut anything that stops you building, so they can expand in all four directions. And secondly, they all effectively grew up in the age of the automobile, so the street yes. width in the center is sufficient to make traveling in from a large distance away fairly easy. Yeah. And so, no, so they, 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 they're very interesting because, of course, the scarcity that's imposed in a San Francisco, say, or a Manhattan, doesn't really apply. You know, I mean, to be honest, you can live 50 miles from Las Vegas or Phoenix. And, you know, it, you know, I mean, it's just a matter of taste. Do you want to live in the desert or do you want to live in the town? I mean, in terms of actual commuting, it's, it's pretty immaterial. Yeah. And that that kind of oscillation of a town center, I mean, every city in the world, I think, has a little bit of like up. A, a bit of a cyclical center uh, issue, town center issue, but in a prairie mm -hmm. town, oh man, the town center can go through a very long down period because box stores can grow on the margin eternally, right? Um, and everybody's so the real estate on the margin is insanely cheap given its proximity to the center. So yes. effectively, you get that risk of a kind of hollowing out. Yes, that's right. Yeah, which is which is also exacerbated, I think, by North American zoning laws. Yes, absolutely. So what what actually people gain from a, from high de higher density housing is mixed retail and residential, and the U.S. has kind of destroyed that really through through this practice yes. of zoning. Yes, that's right. My my father grew up on Ringwood Road in Oxford. I went back there. And he his his house was at the edge of shot over wood. It it was still at the edge of shot over wood, sixty yes. years later. Yeah, um, like the town just didn't expand outward. Um, no, that's incredible. that's the opposite. Which is British zoning often preserves green space outside a. So we have this thing called the green belt outside London, on which it's very difficult to build, both for good and ill. By the way, I think. In the, a lot of it isn't that green. I mean, it, you know, a lot of it isn't that attractive. And, um, and it, it also then it tends to lead to kind of, if you're not careful, you then get ribbon development, which is arguably worse and so on. So I mean, it, it, it is an absolutely fiendish, wicked problem, that whole business of how you get towns to expand. And one of the things we're bad at in Europe, which you're much better at in North America, is just creating new communities. Right. So, yeah. You know, I, 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 um, and, and so what we there's always a propensity to build on the edge of something, which changes the thing itself. Whereas actually you can build a new community near a rail link and a road link in the middle of nowhere. And it really inconveniences nobody. But we're just not very good at it. I mean, I, I, I met someone when I first went to Phoenix. 
I met someone who is a tour guide at, at a docent at the Botanical Gardens in Phoenix, who was at that time, I think, in his late 70s. He'd moved to Phoenix as a teenager where the population was, I think, 35,000. <laughs> and I was just thinking, what a life. You know, you go from that to, what, three and a half billion, the greater metropolitan area, I guess. Right. Yeah. And um, that's something actually which, I mean, Atlanta, Los Angeles was basically a railway town originally, wasn't it, I think. But right. So many of these towns. Rory, yeah. Rory your, your, your love for um, uh, and all your work in, in sort of co commuting and the problems that, you know, related to it, tangential to it, you'd really like to see the, the Canadian prairie, and this is true for the American prairie as well. The towns are spaced one wagon, one day's wagon ride apart. But then, because it's just wagon trains, right? And it's like, yeah. if you're on a wagon train, you must stop predictably at places where you can get some water. Maybe the water was carted by somebody else. And then it's like, enough people stop enough times. It's like, we're going to make a little town and we're going to call it Sutherland, Sutherland, Saskatchewan, right? Oh, there and is there one, is there? No, 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 I just made it up. I, but there's oh, right, no, 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 no. There, there is a Sutherland <laughs> Springs in... There's a Sutherland Springs in Texas, which unfortunately was the um, site for a mass shooting some time, of, um, time ago. But that was, I think that was, again, founded by a guy who'd escaped the Alamo, actually. Or, I, I think, no, hold on. He, yeah, I think, I think his son died at the Alamo, but he left a couple of days early. Um, but I've always, wanted to, I've always wanted to go there as well. But no, yeah. exactly. You basically name the town after yourself and off you go. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 some of them have turned into you know little places we've heard of, such as you know Toronto and um, Vancouver yeah. and Calgary and Edmonton and so on. And some of them have turned in, into nearly the size they were the first the first time two families yeah. stopped with a wagon cart, right? I mean, just nothing's <laughs> happened. Um, and then and then on the railway, you've got something very similar, which is just like you know ra railway stops. Um, Turned into yes. capital city, yeah. Atlanta probably being the most extreme case, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Really, really interesting. Well, um, Rory, if if you've got time that for for one challenge, I what one of the things I I like to do when we interview authors is is put a challenge to them because I think they feel like too frequently people ring them up, and be like, "So your book, tell me about it." It's like, well. <laughs> A great way to learn about it is to buy it and read it. <laughs> um, but one of the things I one of the things I wanted to kind of put to you, uh, if if I can, is you've got this concept of multiple answers to problems as opposed to one answer to a problem. Oh, has our screen froze? Oh no no oh, okay yeah. I've got you. I probably okay, just went into this, a... <laughs> you've got this concept of mul multiple answers yeah. as opposed to one answer. And yet, one of the things it seems to me in your in your God given campaign to say, look, there's psychologic and there's logic that um, there's more than one way of solving a problem, and and the uh, the economists have had their rule of the roost too long. Is you def you absolutely true? Yes, you illustrate and defend that by articulating it's not this is example after example it's not the way that you think it is it's this other way um so it's you know the the, the reason you know maybe that that people buy coca-cola is not the reason that you think um if somebody wants to go buy a drill it's not because they you know wake up and say i need a drill uh no. instead they see it but in all those cases you have to use the tools of conventional economic thinking to come up with the examples that say, no, it's psychologic, as opposed to saying it could be any number of things. It's very tough to say just because you get an input on one side of a black box and an output on the other. Uh, we don't know. And, 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 and you see, I think our model for scientific decision making has come from those rare cases in the physical sciences where you have all the data you need. Hmm. Every The data is numerically available and commensurable. In other words, 
there's a there and and the laws are immutable okay now that is a special case in decision making and yet we've tried to pretend that that's the norm in decision making which it emphatically isn't it's a very very special case where you can say okay the link between air pressure water its boiling point the heat you need to apply to reach boiling point is immutable um, calculable with a single right answer a special case now it's been wonderfully successful that we've discovered these special cases because without that we wouldn't have aviation okay i get that i'm not being a total idiot but i'm still saying it's still a special case and yet we revere the pretense of that kind of decision making in fields entirely inappropriate uh, to that approach because it looks scientific it smells like a science and you know, as I said, you know, uh, it, you know, the opposite of a good idea in in my in my kind of decision making, the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. The solution might lie at a, you know at a completely you know tangential level of intervention. And by the way, there's also a scale dependency on at what level you need to intervene to achieve meaningful difference. Yeah. And actually, potentially, once you acknowledge that and you acknowledge the quote, the scale question, government could become a lot more intelligent because it could actually confine itself to those things which it alone can solve rather than getting involved in the kind of bureaucratic policing of decisions that really should be taken further downstream. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that also contributes to a meaningful life because one of the insights of behavioral science is that we really value autonomy. And the feeling within an organization that no matter what level I operate at, I can still effectuate and influence things is absolutely essential to the rewarding nature of work. Yes. The second you find yourself what someone called below the algorithm, where you're just there to basically tick boxes and um, chase metrics, over which you have no influence and no discretionary judgment. That's the point where the job becomes meaningless and awful. Yeah, and I, I, I just couldn't agree with you more. I, you, you can almost see there's like an instinctive mechanism, like a, like a plant in, in the wrong biozone um, once that happens. People don't even need to consciously register the full articulation of the argument, like, now I have fallen below the zone. No. And I've lost meaning. They'll just they just quietly leave. No, or absolutely suffer, right. Maybe worse. Yeah. Or, or you know, in some cases, I suspect either game the system or seek to sabotage it. Yeah. Yes. So, so I mean, you know, one 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 thing. You know, I mean, gaming the system. Or mindlessly pursue metrics beyond any kind of level of sanity. You know, and you see that happening in Get Back to Trains again, okay? It's the, the obsession with punctuality. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, punctuality is important, okay? But I think we have a situation in the UK where a train operator is fined if a train arrives in London. In London, which is a terminus, okay? It's not a connection. It's a terminus more than three minutes late. But no one on that train has planned their day to that level of exactitude because they know that, well, okay, the only exception would be someone who works above the station, who has a nine o'clock meeting, who wants the train to get in at, at 8.54. Okay, I get, you know, okay, a few you know, exceptional cases, okay? But even then, being two minutes late for a meeting is hardly, you know, disgrace, right? Everybody's built in a margin of error. So why are we obsessing about this, you know, anal level of punctuality? Oh, yes, I get it. There are knock-on effects. If you're 10 minutes late, if you're 15 minutes late, there are all kinds of knock-on effects. But not much. For five, three minutes late, no, not really. Yeah. You know. There's, so that's I the kind of thing where I think, you know, I think the thing becomes absurd. And so you get people who are literally promoted for doing things which are antithetical to the interests of the organisation. What are you um, 
Rory, what, what are you spending your time most on? What are the kinds of engagements that excite you most? Is it category problems, like you said? Uh, it's, uh, taking, certain... it's, taking, it's taking behavioral science insight and creativity, and if you like the decision sciences, into fields where it's never been before. Now, in pure commercial terms, that's probably not the most sensible thing to do because creating a new market is a hell of a lot harder than exploiting the existing market, okay? Um, and I think, actually, I think government should make allowance for that, by the way. I, I have a certain suggestion for government that there are businesses, I'll give you two, okay? Video conferencing on the television, uh, which is a weird, um, a, an open access locker system for e-commerce, okay? There are businesses that should exist but can't exist uh, because they take too long to creating the market without a monopoly takes too long. And I think there is a case for governments doing what they did in the 18th century. Oops, some of this not altogether desirable. OK, which is that you license a company for a certain period of time to uh, enjoy monopoly status in a market that actually needs development. Mm. Now, in electric cars, we had Elon who did it with his own money and with billions of dollars of other people's, okay? You could have accelerated the electric car if you'd actually uh, done what we did. Well, okay. Actually, I guess the Hudson's Bay Company started that way, right? Sure, sure they all did. Right, all right. Yeah, yeah. One of my great. favorite brands, by the way, absolutely glorious. Uh, the British East India Company. I, okay, let's park the ethics for a second, okay? But what you can't say about the British East India Company is that it wasn't a, a, a very lucrative business, okay? Right. And what you could also say is that if you'd had seven competing organizations all trying to do the same thing, none of them would have reached critical mass and they would have actually, you know, they would have all gone nowhere. So I think there is actually a government case for licensing monopolies uh, to perform a certain useful task. The Royal Mail is the obvious case, the Penny Post, to be precise, is the obvious case of a scale network natural duopoly, probably, okay, but certainly monopoly. Uh, and I would argue that Deliveroo and, Go and, you know, all those food delivery companies, effectively, they're a natural duopoly something like that, okay? It's a natural duopoly, and then, then of course, it's a fight to the death. You either get bought or you get killed. And actually, maybe if we license those organizations one city at a time in the way that we license taxis, we would have seen faster, more effective adoption, more innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Because hmm. a growing monopoly still has an incentive to innovate. Monopolies are frightening when they're, exploitative and extractive but at the point in which they're they're actually growing uh you see actually very high levels of innovation I and mean, the, the penny post by the way very interesting story it's always credited rightly to sir roland hill who worked out that if you have enough consolidation of the trunk routes in a mail service the costs of distance relative to the cost of last mile collection, sorting and delivery become so irrelevant per letter that you can afford to have a flat rate postal system for a country, not just a city. Flat rate postal services for cities already existed. But he said you can expand this to a country, but because at a certain level of scale, um, the, the distance becomes an irrelevant component of the cost. Something which I think is still slightly counterintuitive to people who can't, you know, the, the idea that the price should be the same regardless of distance. Okay, yeah. now, what's interesting is in order to, now, one, it didn't make money in the beginning. Secondly, it was a monopoly. It took four years to make money. The Imperial Penny Post, which was the attempt to expand it to Canada, India, and the British Empire, except New Zealand and Canada, and Australia, sorry, that never really made money. Okay, it never reached the volumes requisite to actually uh, achieve the economies uh, at the, uh, the the hub route. Sorry, the you know the central core routes that made distance and irrelevance effectively. Yeah, but it did in the UK, and it would you know you could have a. I think you could probably have an Anglo-Canadian postal service if you wanted to. I think you could probably do that now actually for e-commerce, which would be kind of interesting. Okay, right um, now. 
the interesting thing there is that obviously for the first four years it loses money because nobody knows anybody 50 miles away to write to. Okay, That's right. You know, it takes time for behavioral. But in order to get to justify the mathematics of his idea, um, Hill went to Charles Babbage, i.e. the kind of inventor of the computer, who was probably one of the five greatest mathematicians of his day. And it required a guy of that kind of level of genius to explain how it would work. So network effects patently aren't kind of intuitively obvious. Yeah, and I think yeah. you know it only worked because it, it might have worked as a duopoly, if you've been honest. Might have worked as a triopoly. It certainly wouldn't have worked if you just said, "Okay, this is open to all comers." Yeah, right. And so there's yeah. a written, Douglas McWilliams, who was the former chief economist of IBM, argues that one of the reasons progress is in some respects slowing down is that most progress involves network goods and network goods are very slow to reach critical mass at the point at which they deliver both their value and their profit. Hmm. And so my idea for a nationwide ne uh, network of open access lockers, effectively getting rid of the last mile, also reducing congestion on the roads, also um, uh, uh, allowing you, by the way, because if, if the locker is at a gas station, you can deliver at two o'clock in the morning, you can deliver at four o'clock in the morning, you deliver at 11 o'clock at night. You can't do that in a residential area. Uh, either the recipient goes insane or their neighbours do. Mm -hmm. And so there's something, you know, there's something there which I think government, if government said, OK, what are the things that we can only solve at scale? You know, do you license someone to produce, you know, video conferencing on your television and you have two, you know, you have a competition and whoever wins gets a, a license state monopoly? That might be a really interesting way to get businesses off the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, that led to, you know, uh, slave businesses undoubtedly were funded by effectively the royal license of a monopoly. But I guess the Hudson's Bay Company, or the Bay, as you guys call it, uh, I guess the Bay got started in a similar way. I don't know. I need to investigate. It's 17th century, isn't it, the Bay? I think. Am I right? Yes. Was yes, in, right. I bought one of their lovely right. towels with the stripes. Yeah. Um, here's here's a little uh, pro tip. Um, I don't know who's doing the uh, the the fine wool or the silks, but there are shawls, scarves, and sort of uh, memorial silks that are on par to me to me with Hermes. That they're more they're more rustic in their appearance, you know, and they have like a stylized moose or you know beaver or whatever. But boy, they are like beautifully executed with great materials and. Um, you know, kind of heirloom, heirloom grade, but yeah, the the bay is the bay is a very interesting brand. I mean, um, that, that's by the way a very interesting thing, which is how you read uh, wool suffers from a branding crisis because it tends to be bought as a bit of a commodity, right? Sheep's wool. Now, obviously, that's not true of you know various things like vacuna and cashmere and so on and so forth, which has a scarcity value, but actually. You know, the tragedy of commodities is that effectively the price drops to the bottom and you have no incentive to innovate without a brand to protect your innovation. And yes, so the central right. role that brands play in capitalism is completely under acknowledged because brands, if you look at capitalism as a snapshot, brands look like a cost. But without a brand to which reputational gain can accrue and to which reputational stigma can also attach, you don't have the feedback mechanism within capitalism which rewards improvement in quality. Yeah. You only have a feedback mechanism which rewards reduction in price. And that's a lopsided incentive scheme. When you don't have a brand, and also when you have a very short-term mindset, Cost saving delivers its results faster than quality improvement does because quality improvement relies on consumers recognizing it and yeah. modifying their behavior accordingly. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I wanted to share with you that um, the first time your book was was read, listened to really, because you, you read it yourself, we I convened with seven other gentlemen over beers at the uh, Singapore Recreation Club, Sichuan Food and Tiger your beer at Singapore Recreation Club to discuss it with a reading group. And that was when it was hot off the press. 
Um, so it's it's been given three reads by my crew. We've just loved it. It's um it's a totem now. But thank, well, thank can you. I, can for, I reciprocate uh, then with my shout out to you know uh, I about a third of the favorite people I have to commune with, and I'll add you to this list, a Canadian. Uh, I think that uh, Canadian and Australian intellectual life benefits, in the case of Australia, it's a bit like Australian fauna and flora, which is it's evolved in isolation. So Australian economists like Steve Keen and Nick Gruen are really interesting, partly because they're not exposed to, they're not in the heartland. In Canada, I think you have a differentiation thing where effectively the reason you've kept the monarchy, OK, is a large part of Canadian identity is we're not American. OK, right. Correct. Okay. And in, in both those cases, for separate reasons, I think it's given rise to extraordinary intellectual acuity. Because you effectively, Canadians and Australians, Brits to some extent, because we're in a weird position of being in mid-Atlantic, I think. Um, you, in other words, your view on things is just oblique to the mainstream view, okay? And you see things that other people don't. And so uh, along with you, there's a guy called Tim Kist I speak to. There's Dilip Soman at the Rotman Business School. There's Roger L. Martin, who um, I think is the best business writer and thinker going in terms of... Uh, a proper marketing sensitive appreciation of how business really works. And so, you know, one of the things I often get invitations to speak in Canada, which I always accept if I can, because I love going to Canada and have friends there, but your own homegrown uh, talent is actually extraordinary. I say the same whenever I'm in Australia, you know, you're always bringing in some Brit, but I said, there's a guy down the road who's more interesting than me. <laughs> Yeah. So never, never forget what's on your doorstep. Super. I, I, well, I'm, I'm a huge, that. I'm a huge Canada file. I mean, I always joke whenever I speak in Canada that I'm followed on Twitter by or X. I'm followed on Twitter by Tim Hort Hortons, which is practically <laughs> a gateway to citizenship. But uh... that's super. We we will we will find by hook or by crook. I've something. always wanted to go to Banff because. Uh, I, I nearly went to a conference in Banff and then COVID absolutely killed it and I couldn't go. And, but I'd researched Banff, which looked absolutely glorious, okay? Oh, and I also it. discovered there was a Tim Hortons Gopher Road Banff, which struck me as the most Canadian address you could possibly imagine. So I always have this long-term aim to go to Tim Hortons on go Gopher Road just so I can really... Mark my words, Rory. We will get you there. We have a we have a wonderful family place in in Banff, and it is one of those places you think, um, like New Zealand. You're like, well, this is a little ridiculous. Yeah. This postcard's been like color touched or something. I don't know what. And then when know. you're there, when you're there, you think, holy cow! Um, I know this is that's that's exactly the impression I got. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely astonishing. One day I'll take the train as well through the Rockies. That's another bucket list thing. Yeah. And if you if you could just take a little longer work on the train on your manuscript, we'll get you to Medicine Hat. You can do the. I'll the, get to Medicine Hat. There is a train to Medicine Hat because I know when I saw. Uh, I, when I was in Toronto, we walked past the main station, um, uh, and I, I insisted on going in, and they couldn't really understand. And I just stared, stood and stared at the departure board because what you've got to understand for a Brit is to look at a railway departure board which has destinations that are like a few thousand miles away is just completely yeah. magical and fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Medicine Hat might have been on. Would that be plausible that there's a train from Toronto to Medicine Hat? Um, a vague idea. Well, there would, there's absolutely a train. I don't know if there's a passenger train. So the train that goes through Medicine Hat is, is running constantly, but it's carrying like, you know, bulk ore and oh, okay. train, carts, <laughs> train carts of, uh, of like bauxite and uh, potash and things like this. And I've, actually, I've missed a few great Canadian thinkers. There's a wonderful guy in Montreal uh, who's a kind of dissenting business school professor um, of course, the guy who wrote The Girl, Eli Goldratt's Canadian. Um, it's, right. uh, it, 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 it's an astonishing thing. 
which I think is actually a product of the the evolutionary environment. Um, it's a it's an awesome thesis. I'm gonna I'm gonna like chase that up and think about it. Uh, something I can no, share no, with definitely. you. Definitely. Is so that what the, what we need actually is an Australo. I I I can't speak for New Zealand, but we need an Australo Canadian kind of conference of thinking, which would probably yeah. solve about half the world's half the world's problems <laughs> we solved over a weekend. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Funnily enough, my conversation first thing this morning was with an Australian studying philosophy who was similarly brilliant. So I've, I've actually had a double really? dose today. Wow, excellent. A double double shot of uh, the Commonwealth Espresso. Absolutely, the Commonwealth <laughs> Espresso, yeah. <laughs> Absolute joy. See you soon, and it's been a huge, huge pleasure. So thank you so much. Please stay in touch, because I'm really interested in what you do. Yep, there's no doubt about that. We will. Thank you, Rory.